Olá, boa tarde. Eu sou o professor Edson Gastaldo. Essa é a continuação do nosso ciclo de debates 100 anos de Irving Goffman. E hoje a gente tem a presença especialíssima do professor Rod Watson, que é uh, da, que trabalhou na Universidade de Manchester, Telecom Paris Tech e na Universidade de Macau, entre muitas outras instituições. Rod Watson uh, foi aluno de Goffman, foi aluno de Garfinkel, amigo pessoal de Bourdieu, de, de Norbert Elias e de muitos outros grandes nomes da história da sociologia e da, das ciências sociais. Uh, ele tem muitas experiências e histórias para contar dessas pessoas todas com quem ele teve o privilégio de conviver. Uh, Rod Watson é um dos principais expoentes do mundo hoje na etnometodologia e análise da conversa. Foi um pioneiro em levar essas uh, abordagens de pesquisa sociológica a lugares como a China, o Japão e várias outras partes do mundo. E... Ele é um autor premiado de vários livros, né? recentemente publicou um livro chamado Analyzing Practical and Professional Texts, pela Ashgate, e a fala dele vai ser sobre as descrições sociológicas de Irving Goffman. Eu passo a palavra para ele agora. So, now Rod, it's with you, ok? Thank you so much for being here with us. Brazilian sociology, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I want to thank you for inviting me. And uh, boa tarde, everybody. And uh, now you have heard my entire vocabulary in Portuguese. Boa tarde. <laughs> now, what I'll be doing today is trying to balance out some technical considerations concerning Goffman with a few stories and anecdotes, um, you know, which are more personal, a little more entertaining and the balance between entertainment and personal things on the one hand and a technical appreciation of Goffman on the other. But I want to address, above all, one of the most fundamental issues in sociology and one of the least studied issues in sociology, and that is sociological description. And I want to um, talk particularly, of course, about Goffman and sociological description description. Now, why should sociologists study description? Why should they even be concerned about description? Well, I think it's because sociologists never allow truths about the world to walk naked into their deliberation. The light that sociologists seek to cast on social phenomena is subjected to a technical and conceptual prism or filter that refracts and splits up that light as it passes through. Nowhere is that more true than in sociologists' descriptions of social phenomena. They are always filtered through a prism which bends the light as it goes through. Our initial question then must be, what is the relation between the sociologist's description of the social world and what we might call, as a placeholder phrase, the world as it is. What's the relation between the sociologist's description and the social world that the sociologist is describing? The social world as it is in pristine form. It's a deceptively simple question which has unfortunately a very complicated answer So we must revisit the question several times from different angles in this paper. We shall see that it takes us to the core of Goffman's analysis. If we think about description and think about how Goffman describes the world, that takes us to the most fundamental feature of Goffman's work. Goffman, in this centenary year of his birth, Goffman would appreciate that. He never enjoyed what we could call hagiography. He never enjoyed huge flattery. He never enjoyed massive congratulations um, or praise or anything like that. Uh, he was not so interested in that and would often react negatively to it. If we can 
account for Doffman's work and then begin to provide a criticism of his work in relation to his work on description, then that is something he would have appreciated. He would have appreciated criticism and debate much more than simple congratulation and compliment. Okay, now this paper will just be indicatory. I will point out a few issues that we can develop elsewhere and I shall develop later in the paper that I build from this presentation. Um, we shall develop those issues later and in this paper and I hope that you will develop them along with me. Now, why does the issue of description, sociological description, even matter for sociology? After all, relatively few of them have shown any awareness that there may be any complex issue concerning description. Most of them don't seem to think there is any issue at all concerning description. It's perfectly straightforward, not to be focused on. Sociologists may even criticize or dismiss a sociological study by calling it merely description. Ah, it's just description. It's not analytic, it's just description. Or they may say just superficially descriptive or trivially descriptive rather than consisting in a deeper analysis. So description for many sociologists simply connotes superficiality. In this way, the adjective description may even be used by sociologists as a denigrating term, as an undermining term. If you want to undermine a sociological study, call it descriptive. Of course, a few sociologists, along with some anthropologists, Consider that there can be no adequate analysis of a phenomenon if that social phenomenon has not been adequately identified and described in the first place. But that's not how it is to most sociologists. It is mainly sociologists such as ethnomethodologists, Arby Sachs, and people associated with ethnomethodology like Edward Lowe, who have fundamentally acknowledged the central and fundamental position of description in sociology. In anthropology, for instance, some researchers have taken up a distinction first made by the Oxford philosopher Gilbert Ryle. Ryle makes a distinction between thin and thick description. As you will know, Clifford Geertz, the American anthropologist, developed that distinction in some ways or adopted it and perhaps diluted it in some ways so that it could work as a sort of pillar, as a support for his interpretive anthropology. He was trying to invent an interpretive anthropology and he thought that interpretive anthropology would require thick description. The distinction is this in Gilbert Ryle. Thin description is a description of human action cast simply in terms of the observed bodily motion of a given person. Say a man's raising of his arm with his palm facing forward. This way of describing human action is an externally one. It operates from the outside. By contrast, however, a thick description involves references to such matters as the deeper motive in context dimensions of the hand raising. For instance, the man's arm raising might have communicative intent. It might be motivated by the contextual fact that the man is by a roadside and has seen a small child in the road and is giving a halt sign to an oncoming vehicle. This then would be a deep description of the man holding up his hand with the arm of his hand facing flat forward. And the deep description would involve then what the philosopher Alfred Schutz called an in order to motive. An in order to motive. The hand and arm are being held up in order to protect the child from danger. 
in a way, the distinction between thin and thick description is paralleled in a, in a sense by Max Weber when he distinguished between behavior and meaningful social action. It's that kind of distinction that is at play here. As we know, Ryle's philosophical distinction was later taken up by Clifford Geertz. And Geertz is to be congratulated, I think, for having focused on description, for having understood that there is an issue regarding distinction in the social sciences. Okay, I hope then that I that, that I encourage you to look at description as a topic in its own right for sociologists and anthropologists, and I hope I've encouraged you to treat that analysis of distinction as giving you ground, for instance, to uh, do a critical appreciation of Gottman's work. Our question is, of course, how do Gottman's own particular descriptions of social arrangements align with various features of those arrangements? Are his descriptions of social activities thick or thin? One way of beginning to answer this inquiry, an ethnomethodological way, is to look at the how. How does Gottman produce his characteristic description? What working resources and practices and procedures does he use? Analytic or stylistic, what kinds of things does he employ in producing? And what can we glean from this? written texts and his lectures on this. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that we might look at description as a practice and Goffman's sociological description as a work as a practice that Goffman uh, uses at the work site. When it, if it's with a lectern, talking to an audience, people in a lecture, or if it's in his text, in his books or articles. These are his work sites. What are his practices in producing descriptions on those works? It's remarkable how little, how little explicit <coughs> or systematic or sustained attention the government industry has paid to issues of description. It hasn't paid much attention to the character, status, and functions of Gottman's descriptive work at all. And even when it is mentioned by people like Robin Williams, it's mentioned briefly and then dropped. And I don't know why. When we are looking at professional sociologists' production procedures for description, it brings us to a consideration of what ethnomethodologists and their agnates call work site practice. As I've said, doing describing is an active practice, a practice, in this case, done at a work site, at the lecture, or uh, in front of a test. Let us look at some of the resources and devices that Gottman uses to describe his work. How do those resources and devices used by Gottman give us conception of the world as conceived by Gottman, of activity as conceived by Gottman. When we are looking at this as a work site practice, we have various resources available to us. We can no longer see Gottman working, of course, um, he is not with us, but we can examine the PhD dissertation he wrote we can, re, uh, we can examine the proposal for his PhD dissertation, which, uh, our, uh, which um, Andrew Carlin has just written something about. It's so shortly to be published. Um, another of my friends and colleagues, Eve Wankan, informs me that the PhD dissertation itself will be published soon in e 
um, Dr. Wanken himself is about to publish an innovative and groundbreaking book about Dockman's lecture, including some acute and vivid considerations of Dockman at the lecture. I do recommend this book to you. It's not an ethnomethodological work site study, it's not intended to be, but it has a distinct bearing on these ethnomethodological studies. If you want to have a look at ethnomethodological work site study as they apply to the doing of sociology, there's an article by Anderson and Sharrick in 1984 in the journal Social Analysis. The article is just called Sociological Work and it looks at how conversation analysts find patterns in their transcripts. Okay. Let me give you one or two examples of Goffman's more extreme working practices. And these are for your entertainment as much as, um, uh, as for your information. But I hope, you know, information will happen as well. I hope you'll be informed as well. Um, it's to do with Goffman at the lectern when he was giving lectures. Um, and this incident occurred that I'm going to, that I'm going to tell you about. Um, it occurred at the State University of New York in Buffalo, USA in February 1970. Although I was young and far from having my PhD, I already knew and admired Gottman's work and I still do. And I was present in, my, in the audience along with my friend and colleague Thomas S. Weinberg, who has aided me in this recollection of Gottman at the workshop, Gottman at the lecture. And I hope it will give you a feeling for what a worksite study can do if I give you this little anecdote. And um, uh, it, I hope it gives you, uh, more importantly, a feeling of how Gottman uh, conducted his lectures and how, how Gottman operated at the workshop, what his practices were. Now, Goffman intensely disliked having his photographs taken. And as a result, there are relatively few photographs of him. Yves Wankamp has several of those photographs in his book. However, in the 1970s, Goffman's celebrity status extended far beyond academic life. And so news reporters and photographers turned up at the initial lecture. He made it into the newspaper. At the beginning of the first lecture, and this is a worksite practice in itself, Goffman sternly told the, the news photographers and photojournalists, I'll stand here for a few minutes whilst you take photos, but after that, no more photographs. He duly kept his part of the bargain. He stood for the photographs and then began his lecture. However, shortly afterwards, one non-compliant photographer tried to take photographs of Goffman and his audience during the course of the actual lecture. Goffman turned on him in stentorian fashion, very fiercely, declaring, either I pose for the photographs or I give this lecture. I can't do both. The ferocity, the fierceness of this declaration was issued so aggressively that it caused a a shock to the photographer, who dropped his expensive flash gun on the floor, where it shattered into a thousand pieces. Cowed, the audience collectively snapped into a shocked silence, a silence that pervaded over the entire lecture, lecture and the ensuing ones too. They had been knocked off balance by this dramatic event. And it's to be noted that Goffman, in various ways, whether he was working with text or working in a lecture, he tended to knock his audience slightly off balance uh, to keep them just ever so slightly vulnerable. And in that way, he had the dominant hand. To have a compliant, quiet audience like this suited Gottman because he usually read closely from his minutely prepared notes. However, the unfortunate photographer, the photojournalist, had already obtained a couple of photographs. Um, and you can 
look for one of those photographs in Eve Moinka's fourth domingo. Incidentally, Gilberto Valio, the Brazilian anthropologist, and you all know him, of course, he reported a visit by Goffman and Howard S. Becker to Rio de, de, de Janeiro, um, in which, as so often, uh, Goffman gave lectures on frames and on performance. On game theories and interactions, he gave lectures on those kinds of topics. Again, a student from the stalls interruptively attempted to take a photograph of Goffman while lecturing. Goffman reports that Goffman, uh, sorry, Bellew reports that Goffman again reacted, treating this interruption as invasive, since he would not tolerate any photography whilst working. Yves Wankan informs me of similar incidents in Knoxville and Winnipeg. So there's a pattern here emerging. That outlandish incident that seems so strange in Buffalo happened at least three more times. That makes a pattern. And really, uh, I think some of this was to do, of course, with admonishing the photographer. But it also involves controlling the audience. And this is something that Goffman always wanted to do, to maximize control of the audience. And part of that was to keep them slightly on the back foot, slightly off balance. Goffman's Fenton lectures in Buffalo were again mainly on the subject of frame analysis, which Goffman had not yet published in print. This was only 1970. The lecture was a kind of test bed for his frame analytic argument. Um, he tried to test out his arguments for frame analysis on different audiences for as many as 10 years before the book came out. In Manchester University in 1966, he gave lectures on frame analysis. And so that's a long time before the book itself came out in 1974. But he did also do what conversation analysts call the recipient design in his lectures. He designed his lectures for the audience, for the recipient. Um, Goffman did seem to offer a kind of soft concession to the audience after all this. Um, at the time, in 1970, there was a great deal of mass protest by students, and some of the riots were on the edge of being violent. The media took an apocalyptic view of the situation, but Goffman said, anyone who engages in disrupting public order soon finds the world can manage the disruption. Speaking in his typical way of comparison and citing the unorthodox contemporary musician John Cage's concert for 12 radios, Goffman observed, people sat there and giggled in the concert, but they took it. As, as we've seen with disruptions on college campuses, people become skilled at dealing with disruption. These quotations about society's ability to incorporate disruption Echo the Dirk Heimian influence on Goffman's analysis. And they are also reminiscent of Goffman's interest in remedial interchange. Other echoes, this time of Goffman's frame analysis, came when in Buffalo he spoke about alterations of reality, such as when the normal appearances or presentations of pedestrians on the street are used as a cover for a tap where uh, a, a person appearing normally as a normal pedestrian on the street will suddenly attack another pedestrian. Um, these comments also resonated, of course, with his observations on normal appearances that you can read in Relations in Public, one of his most famous books. So his, his lectures were read closely from notes but they were still largely designed for the recipient they were designed for the audience they made concessions for the audience provided that audience was quiet silent and um, really attentive i hope you haven't resented 
having to indulge me in this digression and these personal recollections. Um, but I hope not only to have given you some new material on Dotman, but also additionally to have, to have, had a, to have added to the understanding of Dotman's practices at one of his work sites, the lecture. I hope to have set the scene for a more detailed analysis of Dotman's work sites, practices, and procedures concerning description. And I'll get into these later on. It's a point made by Goffman himself that many of the intellectual resources with which he worked were already well established in mainstream sociology. He used a great deal from Emil Durkheim and his followers, such as, uh, as Goffman's early mentors, mentor W. Lloyd Warner. Goffman's consistent preoccupation with classification came largely from this Durkheimian origin. Further along the structural functionalist line, Goffman gained inspiration from Talcott Parsons and Parsons a student, Robert K. Merton. From his first book onward, he uses Robert Lincoln's distinction between status and role, a traditional distinction that had become institutionalized in structural functionalism and mainstream sociology. In using these sociological orthodoxies, Goffman considered his own work to be intellectually conservative, to be positivistic, to be realist and empirical, as he explicitly declared in an interview with Jeff C. Verhoeven in 1993. It's therefore ironic that from the 1960s to the 1980s, Goffman was the darling of the anti-positive, anti-positivist, alternative sociology set. He was also a doctor as a hero by other sects of dissenters to the positivistic mainstream, such as the anti-psychiatrists in Britain, in continental Europe and elsewhere. However, Goffman himself always kept his distance from the anti-psychiatrists and from alternative sociology and so on. Um, however, he doesn't just reproduce conventional sociology or classic sociology in its pristine form either. Instead, he really shook it up. He took bits and pieces of conventional orthodox sociology, classical sociology, took these bits and pieces together, put them in a kind of kaleidoscope and shook the kaleidoscope and produced a new pattern completely, a pattern that really hadn't been seen in classical or conventional sociology at all. And this pattern reveals a whole order of phenomena that had only been dimly recognized by conventional sociologists in the past. Many of them hadn't noticed it at all. This is the order that Goffman calls the interaction order. And Goffman's Analyses are set at this level, at the level of the interaction which he tries to explicate, well, tries to describe first and then explicate and analyze. It's, however, it's largely Goffman's own writing practices at the work site, his stylistic techniques and devices, his distinctive use of the language that create this new and this distinctive mix. I often call Goffman's work kaleidoscopic because it does involve this shake of the kaleidoscope revealing a new pattern that hadn't been seen before, a pattern that attested to the interaction order. So there are the same old glass fragments as it were from conventional sociology, but suddenly they were shaken up to reveal something new, a new pattern and a new phenomenon. And that is what Goffman's work site practices do, as do all work site practices. His practices produce an outcome that distinguish just his work and no other. And his work is known as a style that came to be known as Goffman-esque. He did this in a highly crafted way that casts a new light on social phenomena. And some social phenomena were revealed for the first time. 
Okay. Let's have a look at language at work. Goffman's main tool, of course, in doing his sociological description was language. Whilst this paper is intended as a work science paper, rather than a literary analysis, I do concede that it's often been observed that Goffman writes like a novel. His writing has been mentioned in the same breath as some very distinguished novelists in fact. Ivy Compton Burnett, Mary McCarthy, and even the comedy writer Stephen Potter, the author of One Upmanship. Perceptively, Rosanna Trifiletti also mentions the musicality of Goffman. These are complementary comparisons indeed, but one must add the rival that not many novelists write or describe as well as Goffman. Indeed, it's probably right that Goffman's prose has been compared to that of such stratospheric novelists as Marcel Proust. Proust is, indeed, a particularly apt comparison, as sociologists such as Belois have observed. Belwak talks about several similarities between Goffman and Proust, but I think one can only take those similarities so far. When Goffman describes the scene, he tends to use language that somewhat distances him from the scene. Proust uses terminology from within the scenes he is examining, typically seen from the old bourgeoisie, he affiliates, um, I would say, more closely, or at least uses affiliative language. Goffman, as Howard Becker tells us, often uses disaffiliated language. And for instance, uh, the descriptive language that people had used in order to study mental hospitals or asylums, that descriptive language that the mental hospital managers use and the mental hospital staff, the nurses and the psychiatrists use, that is the language of psychopathology, of abnormal psychology. It's medical language. The language that the managers use um, in the asylum is the language of management, what's often called management. Sociologists were often the mouthpieces for the medical staff and the management. The language and vocabulary that sociologists use tended to mirror and rather copy the language that the people who ran the mental asylum used. In that sense, Sociology was affiliated. It affiliated with the people who ran the asylum. It didn't affiliate with the inmates, the patients in that asylum. Goffman was different. He used disaffiliated language. So when describing, for instance, a patient's tendency to collect and hoard small items, seemingly trivial items, such as buttons or bits of cloth or paper clips. Goffman does not dis dis describe this as obsessive compulsive behavior. Though the asylum therapists and management certainly do. Nor does Goffman describe other observed aspects of patients' conduct as manifestations of their mental illness involving, for instance, regression, delusion, and the like. To do so would have affiliated with the management and medics' point of view, a point of view that is informed by the terms of abnormal psychology and management. Instead, Goffman uses other terms to describe these patients' hoarding practices. He uses terms such as secondary adjustment, that is personal adjustment which help salvage the patient's sense of self. The sense of self they had before they had in the asylum, which they're trying to 
retained in the asylum despite serious incursions on that sense of self. Similarly, he describes other aspects of patient conduct in the um, asylum as looping or personal adjustment. Doffman takes meticulous care, care in his use of language. And more contemporary sociologists hope perhaps to do so in order to more scrupulously avoid affiliative implications. By adopting his disaffiliative stance, Goffman reveals the response to contingencies used by mental patients in protecting their selves from the institution's threat. Their response involves the situational logic that the staff vocabulary buries or renders invisible. But Goffman re-describes this conduct to reveal that situation, to find the logic that patients are using in that very threatening situation in the asylum. From this, Goffman argues that mental patients suffer not so much from mental illness as from threatening situational contingencies furnished by the asylum itself. He also argues that their response is coherent, often in involving this employment of the logic of the situation. Again, Goffman has found an element of the interaction order, this time in the interaction of patients, that had been hidden from view by professional sociologists who simply use management terminology or abnormal psychology terminology to describe the goings on in the asylum. Goffman doesn't use that terminology. He uses a more distant terminology which reveals something that the conventional sociologists and the conventional management clinic people had simply concealed and had concealed unwittingly because they hadn't noticed those hidden features of the interaction order themselves. Now, this rewording practice, Howard Becker tells us that this rewording practice of Gottman is reminiscent of that of novelists who give their characters a variety of different voices in order to simply not represent the dominant voice. It would be wrong, however, to read Becker's um, to read Becker's comments of Goffman as claiming that Goffman's descriptive and analytic vocabulary was always and invariably neutral. Often his vocabulary preserved that preserved that of the underdog or the outsider, and in this way can be read as affiliative. He was often attacked for this. To characterize this attack as Lincoln and Lee Hurwitz do, mainstream sociologists ask, how can Goffman side with the bad guy? Dorff, too, writes of Goffman's underworld view. At that time, the underdog or underworld view was hugely, con hugely controversial in sociology. And Goffman had the delicious ability to unite right and left-wing mainstream sociology together in a howl of protest. Um, right and left-wing sociologists both tended to condemn Goffman's work. But he loved it. He wanted to enrage everybody. And he did. He didn't care. Okay, then. Of course, Goffman is sometimes affiliative. He does use affiliative language too. He often say, for instance, we normal. In stigma, he talks about we normal, which affiliates him with normal people. Uh, that kind of thing. Okay, then. So this then is the descriptive work of uh, Irving Goffman. Um, at its heart. Now, there are some features that we will need to look at 
if we want to deepen our analysis of how Gottman goes ahead. The language that Gottman uses, uses is mainly just ordinary language. He uses it brilliantly. But as Edward Rose argues, he is still using the natural language. And within the natural language, Rose argues, there is a natural sociology embedded within it. By natural here, Rose means ordinary, non-professional. So we're talking here about non-professional language, the English or the Portuguese language, with a natural sociology embedded within it. That is, every language contains natural sociological knowledge within it. And it is this knowledge that relates to Gottman's work. Um, because Gottman counts on our knowing society as a natural phenomenon in order that his own analyses work, in order that they can work, in order that they can be recognizable descriptions of that world. So this leads to a major issue, and that is that the social world that Gottman describes and the social world that all sociologists describe, this social world is a world that has already been described. It's been described by ordinary society members using their natural language and using their natural sociology. They do this in their routine affairs. Gottman relies on that, but of course, his imagery also depends upon the natural language. And it's simply the fact that Gottman uses that natural language brilliantly. But it is still the natural language and it contains a natural sociology within it too. So what we are saying about Gottman and all sociologists in fact is not that they are describing society, but they are re-describing society. They're describing society in a way that ordinary people might understand and might not. But it's a re-description of what ordinary people say when they're describing them. The descriptions of ordinary people are being re-described by sociology. In that sense, sociologists are being involving themselves in a redescription of the social world. It's a so there is therefore a question: Is sociologists are redescribing the social world that's already been described by ordinary people using their natural language and natural sociology? What is the relationship between Gottman's description and other sociologists? and the pristine world that's already been described by ordinary people before the sociologist has come along. Well, firstly, this means that Gottman's sociology is, like all other sociologists, a mixture of sociology employing natural conceptions as ordinary people would, but employing them for different purposes than ordinary people would employ them for. These purposes are the purposes of analysis. And just to show you how Gottman uses so many terms from ordinary sociology, let me, uh, let me uh, give you one or two examples. Um, Rose, Edward Rose, wrote a paper in Oh, 1960, a long time ago now. And he talks about various terms like role and behavior and so on. And in this way, he talks about how old some of these terms are. And many of these terms like behavior go back to the 1400s. So in that respect, Gottman is using ordinary terms that have an evolved meaning 
and he can't escape from these means. The term behavior was first recorded in 1490. And its meanings and usages have with changes and stabilities evolved since then and continue to strongly influence uh, both lay and professional sociology. The term symbol was first recorded in 15, the term role in 1606, the term norm in 1635, status in 1686, interaction being a late term in 1832, but it's still a term that's almost 200 years old. You can see that when it comes to English, Goffman is using ancient terms, terms which have evolved social meaning that give us our current natural sociology and Goffman is building his sociology on power. Okay then, let's finish by having a little bit of a think about Goffman and his use of metaphors and similes. Well, first of all, Goffman at least doesn't intend to use metaphor, to use a simile. He doesn't say the world is a stage. He doesn't say the world is theatre. He says the world is like a stage and like a theatre. He uses a simile. And then he doesn't really make that simile um, very, very extensive. He says that sometimes the world is not like a theatre. Not even a theatre is always like a theatre, he says. So, you know, he's very careful and he shows road distance, the very thing that he describes in using these images. But of course, these images, the image of the theatre particularly, is what he is known for. And they are very important. They help us look again at something very, very familiar. If you look at society, there are very many familiar things about it. When you look at those things through the prism of Goffman's trope, the similes, then you can see them with fresh eyes and you see that familiar thing anew. And it's very, very important because you see things that you didn't notice before. So in that way, Goffman can use a simile to reveal the taken for granted aspect of social phenomena and to link those phenomena with other phenomena to find a pattern. So things that seem to be very different, if Goffman uses the same metaphor for those phenomena, he can bring them together and find a pattern in them, even though in natural sociological terms they seem to be very different. That is what he's doing with his simile. And there is, of course, a kind of a problem here too. If you say that, if you say that live, that social activities are performances or rituals, this is, of course, Similarly, because you're, because government's saying they're like performances or like rituals, but there is a problem with those terms themselves. And I'll focus a little bit here on the term performance. Um, and as an aside, I might say that one person, Morris Stein, has said, "Well, Gottman isn't the person who uses metaphors and similes. Everybody in sociology does." They all use metaphors and similes. For instance, for Morris Stein, the term system is a simile or even a metaphor. Um, the term organic solidarity is a metaphor or simile. Um, in other words, the root metaphors of sociology are these metaphors or similes. They're, they're the root images that we use in sociology as a discipline. So Goffman isn't the only person who uses similes or metaphors. He's the person who uses them best. It's a bit like going to a football match and seeing a, some professional football being played by ordinary players 
And then suddenly this guy called Pelle comes on the screen. Then everything changes. That's what happens with government. Government is the Pelle. Now, finally, I would like to ask you a few questions about the use of these similes in Gottman. We talk about Gottman's use of the term performance. We talk about Gottman's use of the term theatre and similar things, on stage and off stage. I noted, for instance, that uh, with this uh, streaming service we are on now, um, when I was waiting to get onto it, it told me I was backstage. Now that I'm on the service, I'm seeing that I'm in the show. That's a performance similar metaphor in this case. What we can say about these similes is simply this. A simile is no better than the vocabulary that makes it up, than the natural sociological terms that make it up. And it's the natural sociological meaning and usages and logical grammar of these terms that influence whether the metaphor or simile is apt or not. And sometimes Gottman's similes and metaphors are not apt. Let me tell you what I mean. If you refer to something as something in ordinary life, not on the stage, but just in ordinary life, as a game, or as theatre, or as play acting, we are depending on the natural sociology meaning of the term play acting, or theatre, or game. We are looking at its logical grammar as ordinary people use. Now, ordinary people use terms like performance, theatre, play acting in a particular way. They use it to downgrade or downrank the sense of reality that we have. So if we refer to something as a game or as only a game, we're saying it's not serious. It's not part of the serious thing. It's play. When you are discussing a surgeon performing an operation, talking about performance, or talking about it as a game, then there is a problem because here is a serious thing, serious activity being re described as using terms which indicate non serious, which indicate the non serious. This is a problem, isn't it? Because here we are setting ourselves up in competition with how ordinary members see a surgical approach, if we are calling it a game. In other words, there is what sociologists call a methodological irony. We are downranking and downgrading the activity of that surgeon in relation to the actual seriousness that surgeons and the surgical team are imputed in actually conducting that operation. So that's a massive problem. It might be said that Doffman is ironicizing what the surgeon does and in many respects is misdescribing it in relation to how the surgeon and the surgical team would see this activity of performing operation. So there is a major issue there. And in this major issue, we need to be very, very careful. I have some examples about um, the term performance, for instance, that 
I gave in a previous uh, paper that had been published in Portuguese in a journal called Veredas. Um, these come from the Guardian, the editorial column in, column in the Guardian, which is a, a national British newspaper. It's about British governmental measures taken against Russian oligarchs and their funds, which are based in Britain and have been money laundered in Britain. The Guardian is arguing that the measures that the British government has been taken are not effective and are in fact deceptive. The Guardian editorial says, closing the door so late is a performative gesture, gesture not a strategy for security. And then in the body of that editorial item, the Guardian says, the belated governmental action against the Russian oligarchs and their funds will prove another performative stunt designed to create an impression, not achieve a material goal. So you can see from this, everybody, that um, the term performance is sometimes used in this way to indicate that it's simply keeping up appearances, simply deceiving people, simply up there for show rather than for achieving any serious purpose. That it's there in a token way, tokenistic way, a deceptive way, rather than really getting to grips with the real and serious problem. Now, no matter what Goffman says about performance, theatrical, simile or metaphor, it can't be redefined to get rid of these ordinary language connotations, this ordinary language logical grammar, as we can put it. In that respect, there's a problem with Goffman's use of this imagery. And that is what we need to think of. So what I'm really talking about here, in terms of Goffman on sociological history, we need to ask several questions. The first is, how does Goffman produce these sociological descriptions at the work? Secondly, how do these sociological descriptions relate to the ordinary sociological world which we might call the pristine social world as it exists before, before the sociology Goffman approaches? Uh, thirdly, what work do these images, these tropes, these figures of speech do? What, what kind of work do, do these figures of speech do? And what work do they achieve? And part of the achievement, I would suggest to you, is that very often in Goffman's work, is that it downgrades the ordinary activity in a hierarchy of realism, seriousness, sincerity. A performance indicates that something is not realistic in some way that it is not serious and of course that it is not sincere that it's meant perhaps a deceptive purpose. So I would say that what we need to begin to do is ask these questions, look at sociological description as a topic in its own right in the first place, and then look at how this issue of description figures in Goffman's work or the work of any other sociologist we would like to examine. And that is where we will begin to get somewhere. We can then establish a very strong basis for a critical appreciation of Goffman's work. And just again in this centenary year of his birth, let us remind ourselves of what Goffman would have wanted. He would have wanted a critical appreciation of his work. He wouldn't have wanted a hagiography. He wouldn't have wanted psychophancy and flattery and compliment. 
we know that very often he rejected often derisively. He would have wanted a balanced analysis of his work, a balanced understanding of his work, and a balanced critical appreciation of it. There is a very famous case in which um, a sociologist, Gail Jefferson, submitted a paper of Gottman to a very rigorous critique indeed. And Gottman wrote a, a very, very generous letter expressing his gratitude for these criticisms and for these corrections. He wasn't at all angry or frustrated about it. He was very happy to have them because he knew that he could improve his work by taking these criticisms on board. This is the kind of person that Goffman was as an academic. So really, the Goffman industry in the past has tended towards curating his work. They are the antiquarians of Goffman. They preserve his work in formaldehyde. It never changes. What we need to do is ask the kind of questions that I've been asking, try and produce answers to them, and from those answers do a good critical appreciation of Gottman. That is what he would have appreciated. He wasn't very keen on having his work preserved in aspect, having his work preserved as though it were um, never to be changed, never to be modernized, and never to be updated. If we get a proper critical appreciation of doctrine, we can begin to update it, we can begin to modernize it and make sure that he remains relevant for another century or more. But if we leave it, as these conservatives of the Goffman industry leave it, then the body of Goffman's work will, will not change. It will not be updated. It will not be modernized. And it will lose its relevance in the eyes of subsequent generations of sociology. So let us not be worried about criticizing. It is what he would have wanted. And in honoring him in his in the centenary year of his birth, and that is my plea, really. Don't spend too much time with the conservators and antiquarians in the government industry. Instead, do what I'm recommending, please, and don't be afraid to criticize him. Positive as well as negative criticism, sure, but those criticisms um, are related to the updating of his work, maybe to the refashioning of his work to keep it modern, and to keep it contemporary, and to keep it at the forefront of sociology. Right, that's what I'd like to uh, say this evening, and I hope you enjoyed this, um, and I hope that, that there can be some questions now uh, from the audience. And thank you for listening to me. Okay, Rod, thank you so much for your fantastic lecture. And uh, while I'm waiting for, for uh, some other questions of our audience, I'll uh, make a personal question to you. Okay. Um, Irving Goffman often declared himself a Durkheimian. He did. Uh, nearly a positivist. Yes. Uh, sociologist and deeply rooted in empirical analysis. Yeah. This is what he, he says of himself, okay? But how does that fit with his use of invented examples of unorthodox data collection, like uh, figures from literature, like the famous story of Pretty, uh, yes. going to the beach, that fantastic yeah. story. That's at the beginning of presentation of self in everyday life, if people want to look at it. It's a very funny piece. Yes. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. When I was yes. taught, when I was taught Goffman by Anthony Giddens, before Giddens told us about Goffman at all, he read this passage about Freedy. He read this passage about Freedy out to us. And then he began his 
lecture on government. So it's a very important uh, example. Um, if I may answer the question, um, if I may answer the question, I think that um, there is a very big question over the use of inventors' examples. There is a very big question, if you're a positivist, about the way you describe those examples using terms like performance and using terms like theatre. So if you are a positivist, how empirical these terms actually and really are is another matter. I think what we can take from what Goffman said is that it was an aspiration. He hoped to be empirical and wanted to be empirical and wanted to be positivistic. And the other thing that I think he wanted to do when he said he was empirical and positivistic and classical in his approach is that he wanted to distance himself from those alternative sociologists, the radical sociologists and um, the anti-psychiatrists and all these people who had adopted him as a kind of guru. They want to take him as a guru, and essentially, if you'll excuse the terminology, Gottman simply told them to piss off. I think part of him calling himself a positivist was to get rid of the anti-positivist lobby who tended to see him as a latter-day saint. I see. <laughs> and uh, what about the idea of uh, a systematic naturalistic observation? as a method. What about this? You know, Goffman says, uh, my method is a systematic naturalistic observation. There's something like going out and watching what people do. <laughs> well, yes, but it, that, is, that is true. And his work is much more systematic than people say. Emmanuel Shegloff used to say that it was quantilist, that it was like those painters post-impressionist painters like Signac and Seurat, um, who made pictures out of little dots, wonderful pictures out of dots. Um, people like Shegloff said that Doffman created pictures out of dots too. Um, but ultimately what we have is the pictures and the pictures were very systematically done. There's more system in Doffman than people think because they have simply failed to identify and analyze that system. It is a systematic analysis in various ways. And in a way, his metaphors have a big plus, and that is that they do systematize these little dots, these little examples that he gives. He brings them all together under the rubric of a metaphor, and you can see a pattern in them. So, you know, he can look at a prostitute on the street, he can look at a bank manager when you're asking the bank manager for a loan. Um, he can look at a whole variety of very different situations and people and find that they are using the same technique in their action. They are using road distance. So he finds a pattern in these very different things, in these very different dots. So there is a systematicity there. There is no question. But when he talks about systematic natural observation, I think that in a way, there's, that is an outcome. It's not a method, it's an outcome. There is a little question that remains, and that is, how do you do this systematic observation? And if you are using metaphors and similes to do those observations, as Goffman did, how adequate are they to the proper description of the thing you are trying to study and systematize. And that seems to me to be the big problem with Gotham. There are pluses as well as minuses to his use of terms like performance, but the minuses need to be taken into account. Okay, anybody else? Uh, let me see, just let me check here. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, not really. I think uh, we are fine here. Uh, I just uh, while while you were, were uh, giving a lecture, I was thinking about 
the several metaphors that other theorists uh, use and they get so uh, uh, naturalized by people like like uh, reason yeah. or uh, device or uh, and many uh, the um, ordinary words from natural life that come into theory and they become theoretical concepts and yeah. uh, people yeah. can get rid of this and uh, yeah. why does nobody did what Goffman did why why nobody uh, followed this trend the Goffman left no heirs in uh, in a sense he yeah. influenced yeah. several people all over the world but uh, there was no Goffman follower no Goffman uh, uh, yeah. that, what Goffman did. That is true. I think that is true. I think he left no heirs, certainly no heirs worthy of his name, because people who followed haven't correctly identified what it is that Goffman did. Now, Goffman often used the term uh, machine for uh, looking at society. He said he wanted to have a mechanistic view of society. And he used the term machine for looking at his own technique in looking at society, too. He said uh, very often that his uh, imagery, the terms like uh, images like performance, uh, like game, and all the rest of it, that, that these were, of course, used as similes, but they were machines for creating insights. He used them. He, do, he doesn't just have personal insight. By using these metaphors, he's got a machine for generating insight. And that was the kind of thing that he did. And um, I think that those kinds of issues haven't been properly explicated by uh, the government industry. I think I told you once, Edison, that um, in a museum in London, there is a philosopher called Jeremy Bentham. He died well over a hundred years ago, but he is still there because his body is kept in a big jar of formaldehyde. So you can see Jeremy Bentham still in this jar of formaldehyde. He is exactly as he was when he died. Oh. The trouble is we've kept Goffman's work in a bottle of formaldehyde too. The work is exactly as it was when Goffman died. Yes, indeed. There's uh, so much work to develop this, this fabulous... Uh... I think so, and we need to think in a different way than, than the people who've been in the Goffman industry, who were museum keepers in a way. They wanted to, uh, you know, they wanted to curate Goffman's work. And there is a place for that, but it can't be the only game in town. It can't have a monopoly. There must be people who are working towards a critical appreciation of Goffman so that we can use his work in the future so that it remains fresh and new. Because there's nobody like Goffman, but we can hope to develop that work to make it relevant and to make it live and to make it analyze uh, the situation in, again, an insightful way. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for, for now, Rod, for your fabulous lecture. It's a and great pleasure. You know, we all thank you so much for, for being here with us. And uh, your lecture will be available on video for showing people. In, so I can send you then afterwards the link if you can uh, you. pass it over to your students and uh, in our friends. And uh, we stay here now. And thank you so much for everybody that's talking with us. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you everybody for uh, hanging on and listening uh, to me and to Edison. Uh, I'm very grateful to you and I wish you the best in your Goffman study. Please bring Goffman forward. Thank you so much.